This Final Cut Pro 10 tour presentation is brought to you by the LumaForge Share Station, the world's best storage for Final Cut 10. For more information on how the Share Station can improve your workflow, head on over to LumaForge.com. Okay, so my perspective is purely um, as an editor approaching this um, talk, so um, understand that. And I think the unique perspective that I have to give for this evening is handling tons of footage, so a lot of footage. At the moment, I'm working on a film called The Unknown Soldier. It's a Finnish feature film, and I've got screenshots of that and some of my working methods, the workflow that we're using at the moment. Um, so that's The Unknown Soldier, director Akul Lohimies, and the previous gig, well, previous, previous gig, I did a documentary between these two, also on Final Cut 10, uh, it was Rebellion. That was a five-part series for Ireland's broadcaster, RTE. Briefly on Rebellion, um, Ireland, I, I worked at Windmill Lane Pictures, which is basically an avid post-production house. Uh, they also have Final Cut 7 installed. Uh, and then I came along, I said, would you mind, could I, could I please edit on, on X? Uh, Windmill said, uh, yeah, sure, why not? We've got no experience, but we'll give it a go. So I brought my Mac Pro with me. Uh, they set it up in their uh, machine room, and uh, we worked off uh, the Avid's ISIS system, and it worked great, actually. One thing that the IT guys said on the, my final day when I was leaving um, Windmill Lane was that, you know, they expected to see me or, or to actually visit the edit more often than they did, and they hardly ever visited my edit, because there, there were no problems, there were no technical problems. At get-go, we had some issues, uh, but we very quickly realized that the issue was that I was storing the library on the ISIS, and it just didn't work, so I just, we relocated the library to a, a local, regular USB drive, and it was fine. The Unknown Soldier. I'll get the boring statistics out of the way. Uh, Ari Amira, 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 ProRes 422HQ. 458 hours of footage at the moment, so we've still got, actually, this is, not, it should be 82. We've got 10 more days of shooting, plus any extra days that we might need. Um, now, 458, I, I'm the kind of editor that, that I, I'm known for taking on a lot of footage. It's okay, I like it. I always joke with the directors that you cannot shoot too much. Um, now, I'm not too sure about that. <laughs> that's, a, um, that's a lot. I mean, that's a lot even for me. And those of you who edit, you know very well that it's kind of like a, a game of remembering. It's like, you know, the card game that you play, you have the cards face down, and then you turn them over one by one. Um, it, it's like having this whole hall full of cards, and you're trying to remember what's where. Um, so that brings me into the theme of, uh, of my talk. Uh, now, I use Google Translate. I have no idea if that's correct. <laughs> so I hope it is. Um, how to see the forest for the trees. So when you've got so much material, how on earth are you actually going to see the story? And um, it's easy to get blinded. So I like to talk in philosophical terms. So, forest for the trees, right? So we've got the beats up there, and we've got the story down here. Now, the beats could be, you could, they're like leaves, okay? Shots could be branches, scenes could be a tree, uh, or, or bushes for sequences, whatnot. But in the end, if the story is an abstract, a theme, love will conquer all, or whatever, uh, but the beats up there, I mean, that, they're concrete stuff. I mean, it's, it's audio and visuals. So how it's so easy to get lost when we know what the theme is, what we're trying to say, but then we need to transpose the abstract or the concrete to the abstract and vice versa. And this is where you can get lost. And when you've got 458 hours, it's very easy to get lost. This is what I'm interested in. My daily work is trying to figure out the way that that actor or character 
lifts up her eyebrows, could be adapted to this part of the theme, and it would work to advance our story. I mean, that's how an editor would think, of course. Editing is all about, and every single NLE does this, it's basically we synthesize, right? Uh, but to synthesize, we have to analyze, break apart. Now, I think Final Cut 10 is really good in the breaking apart point. Now, every other NLE can handle these, Avid or Premiere, but these, I think, are unique to Final Cut 10. Well, I like to think of it in terms of Newtonian uh, physics compared to quantum physics. Newtonian being, in this case, the Avid organizational method or Premiere to uh, Final Cut's approach, and I'll show you what I mean. This is scene 69E from The Unknown Soldier. And you can see this is after I've analyzed this particular scene. Um, you can see, obviously, the, my rejections, my favorites. I've got markers there. And this, was this screenshot was taken early on. Um, it actually, there's only one little blue line here, but these will grow. So, of course, this is a keyword um, range. Now, some of you might be thinking, hang on a minute. These aren't keyword collections. These are smart collections for bins. Now, that was uh, my assistant editor came up with this idea that why don't we use smart collections instead of keyword collections because the problem with using keyword collections uh, as bins is that you get the blue line over everything. Now, because we want to analyze, we need all the tools that we can get. So I've got red, uh, green, and eventually blue. Now, the blues will be, when I'm trying to figure this scene out in detail, I'll probably use the blues for a certain character giving a certain kind of line, either uh, from this angle or a reverse angle, and it'll just help me figure it out what's going on. Now, each take can be anything from two minutes to 10 minutes. So if, if you see the markers there, that would be a, a restart of the take. The cameras are always rolling. There's a lot of movement in the takes. So within one take, there'll be many, many angles. Uh, OK, it's just another scene. Oh, how I use folders. So if we have a sequence uh, of scenes, I'll put them into folders. It says bunker attack there. Now, organization. Least sexiest thing in the world, but I think if you don't organize, you don't know what you've got. And if you don't know what you've got, you don't have a chance of giving it your best shot at actually creating a, meaningful, a good story, a well-told story. I came up with this. I had an argument, by the way, with a German editor years ago when I said, I've got this theory that there's two phases in editing, a mechanical uh, stage or phase and a creative phase. And, uh, and he didn't like at all that I used the term mechanical editing. But uh, what I mean by mechanical is everything that happens before the creative stage. So that would be, um, uh, of course, organization, uh, adding the metadata. Even the assembly cut would be mechanical. John walks through the door. He meets up Karen. Karen, they say this and that, and then Karen storms off. OK, that's an assembly. It's just jug, 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 jug. There's nothing creative about that uh, editing-wise. But I, I use the term phases because on a good day, if I'm in a creative mood, I can get something done that's actually worth doing, that actually that has an idea to it. This scene is actually now pretty good. But it's a... It's a phase, so some days you're in mechanical mode, some days you're in a creative mode. Mechanical mode can be long and tedious. Creative modes, for me, uh, are usually very short. You know, it could be a couple of hours, and you've done a huge amount of work, really good work, but then it's over. It's like you're out of creativity for the day. But I've realized that my way of working, usually when, when editing, it takes forever to start to be creative and actually starts to look good. It's a race against time. This is what it used to be like. The shoot would begin, you know, a week, two weeks beforehand. And then some, at some stage, when you've got enough material, editorial can begin. Now, we're working like this. Now, some of you may say, well, hang on a minute. That's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but it's not, because during this time, you're working, editorial is working on workflow. So how are we going to get this to, how are we going to automate everything? Because once we start, we've got that runway, we have to get the plane in the air. And um, plus, uh, I'd be analyzing the script with the director. A lot is happening, uh, discussions with the cinematographer. A lot is happening before the actual shoot begins. Of course, we'll also have test material that will be flying through. And now, because of the time restraints, the, the earlier the edit can begin, that means the VFX can start. I don't know if you can see it, it says VFX, the blue line. Music, the composer can start working, sound design. But the mechanical process really is about programming your subconscious, um, feeding your, mem your mind um, with all the beats, all the moments, all the emotions in the material, so that one spectacular day moment during your editing period all of a sudden you're going to have this brainwave and, oh, I know how this, this film is going to be. This is how we turn this character interesting or this is what we're going to do with this scene or this order. Now, for The Unknown Soldier, I was on or near location from get-go. This is one day. Now, of course, it starts with the shoot. So you shoot something, they start shooting in the morning. By evening, they've shot, they've, they've given all the cards to the DIT. He will then do an overnight transcode in this particular film uh, and create ProRes proxy files. The assistant editor, my assistant editor, Tony, would then wake up, I think he would start his day at 8 a.m. or 7 a.m., depending on how much material, and then prepare everything uh, for me. And I would doze on in at 10 or 11 or something like that. So he would have actually two or three hours uh, of, of head start not a lot, but by that time, I will have an XML of the whole previous day. So if we shoot on Monday, on Tuesday morning, I'll get the offline files, everything's all logged up. And by the end of the Tuesday shoot, the director will then come into the edit, and I will show him uh, an assembly from Monday. So the director will say, OK, this is what I shot on Monday, uh, a really rough assembly, it's just da, 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 da. That moment in between, the automization is we have the sound coming from uh, the Arton, the Arri cameras, and then we have the script supervisor working on Numbers iOS, into X, sync and link, back again, uh, shot notes, metadata added, back to sync and link, Y twice. Because I, I wanted multicams as well, more on that in a moment. Uh, then this, would, this is what would be delivered to me. So this is day 59, and there, here are the, the scenes, and then I can start um, actually going through the material. Sifting down material. This is scene 303. Uh, 108 items, one hour, 17 minutes. This is an action sequence. I've got um, multi-cam clips here, and then I've got the separate A, B, and C cameras. First thing I'll do is um, get rid of the multi-cams, because I use the multi-cams only for reference to help me figure out what camera was where during the shoot. I, I don't actually use them to edit with because of the uh, cumbersome uh, way that X now, you, you cannot uh, decompose the multicam clips. Um, now, I'm not 100% sure, can you do that in 10.3? Because I haven't had time. No, says Philip. Um, if you could, I would probably use them on the timeline, but at the moment I can't. So we, bring it, we get rid of the multicams, we've got 56 minutes of actual shot material, all clips are showing. Uh, then after I do my rejects, when I'm screening through, I have uh, 23 minutes. So more than half for this particular scene was out. So now I know that for this scene, I actually only have 23 minutes of, uh, of good material. Well, let's sift again. Uh, now, these are my favorites that I made. I've got four minutes, four and a half minutes of really good moments. So for me, a favorite is something that's exceptionally good that, will, that I hope will end up in the film. Um, and then if I sift again using just camera angle A, you see I've only got one, one minute 20. So down from an hour to, to just uh, um, 23 minutes, of usable footage down to the best of the best of camera A. And that's one way that helps me see the forest for the trees. Um, here, so multicam, this is how I use multicam, so I just click it on to 
now just show me the multicams, all of a sudden, in one, one window, one view, I can see everything that we've got, quickly open them, say, oh, I see, so A was doing that, B was there, oh, I, I get it. And I can watch that in real time and get some, grasp some kind, get some kind of idea what's going on. Remember, these are very long takes. For the purpose of uh, this, I usually have two screens set up, but I put it into one screen, and I just, like a 10,000 times speed. Here you can see me going through the material. Okay, I'll reject that, I'll keep that, favor that. But it's basically, this is mechanical editing. Then I've got the assembly that's come from uh, my assistant editor sometime during the day. Um, and now that I've seen the material, I'm now tweaking his assembly. So by, so by the uh, night time, when uh, the director comes into the edit, I will have a tweaked assembly, so I know what's going on in that assembly. And I also know what options we have in the footage. I figured out to keep someone, I think, uh, was it Robert that said, you want to keep your library as light as possible? Well, that's what I've, I've realized in Final Cut 10, it can get bogged down if, if you've got a lot of sequences. So I've also got a separate library called Overflow. So when I've, if it's got a green tick, it means I've gone through that day, gone through the uh, assembly, I've added it to the master timeline, which is now 5 hours 36 minutes long. It's been added, so now I can get rid of these days, uh, day sequences. I no longer need them. They'll go into overflow. My library is, I think it's 2.3 gigs big. Now remember, everything is external. All the media is external, so it only has aliases inside it. This would be my normal setup on two screens plus the client uh, monitor. Uh, just a quick, very brief look at um, organization uh, of my library. I have one library, events. You see the, the white dots are acts. So scene 0 to 70, that's act 1. So when you do a match frame, it won't open the entire library. It will only open uh, an, uh, one act. Now, it's still a lot of material, but it's a lot less than it opening everything. Um, now, this, that's TS for the Unknown Soldier. Tunks, which is what I now testing, I'm testing on 10.3. Here are all the tracks I've got. I noticed in 10.3, I've lost the name. So you can see I actually do have the channels are named, but down here they're all just connected. Maybe it's a bug. Maybe it's when it translated in from the 10.2 something to 10.3 that we lost those uh, naming conventions. Back to the theme, seeing the forest for the trees why I like this program, uh, why I use it. Uh, any questions? I'm sure we don't have time for any questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, but if anyone has a really good question, just one, it's short. After, afterwards, okie doke. Well, thank you very much.